the title. All right, is that big enough for the, for the, okay. okay. All right, um, so thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and to be able to talk about uh, static geometry. So I'll be giving the first two lectures in the series. Uh, the first lecture will be on adding and perfected spaces. And what I'll try to do is to summarize the theory, give you an introduction if you're not so familiar with it, review some concepts if you, I've studied them before, but maybe forgotten. Um, and obviously, I, I have a little bit more than an hour to cover these spaces, so they'll be, I have to be brief on certain aspects, but I'll try my best to cover the most important concepts of these, okay? Right, so let me start with a review or introduction um, of attic spaces. And so um, let me first give a few words on the motivation. So there's a classical motivation for introducing them to the development of the theories due to Huber. And um, well, he managed to build a category that uh, so they form a category, these attic spaces, which um, simultaneously contain, this category contains the category of formal schemes and rigid analytic spaces as full subcategories. It gives you a uniform, a uniform framework to, to work with um, objects of both kinds here. <clears throat> but for us, at least today, there's an additional motivation. Because we want to learn about perfected spaces. So if you're interested in perfected spaces, then the first thing you should do is to learn about attic spaces. Hmm. In perfected spaces, they form a certain kind of, these are special kinds of attic spaces. And so, yeah, let's learn about these attic spaces first and then talk about the special kind later, okay? And then often, yeah, and then, then tomorrow we'll go on and do further periodic geometry, we'll learn about so-called diamonds and so on, and so it, this will get us even further, but um, right, that's the starting point. We okay, can so the building blocks. Let me let me move over here. Should I pull this up? Is this better? Yeah, probably. Okay. So if you want to build an attic space, and let's learn about how to do this. So this. The building blocks for them are called affinoid attic spaces. And just like in algebraic geometry, when you first build schemes, you start with a ring. So here, this is, this is also analog. So you start with so-called affinoid attic spaces. So let me tell you about those. So they're denoted by spa A, A plus, and I'll just give you an introduction about these ingredients for each, for these parts. Okay, so I'll first talk about A, I'll tell, tell you what the A plus is, and then I'll do, try and review what, spa, what the spa construction is. So what's A? So the starting point, the crucial definition here is, it's a topological ring. Topology is defined in a certain way. We call them Huber rings. And 
and you kind of hold the ring as the follows too. So if there exists an open subring, a naught and a, whose topology is the iadic topology. And here I is an ideal, is an ideal in A naught, and it's absolutely crucial that it's finitely generated. Okay. And then, so you call this definition, if you, uh, you call these A naughts, they're not uniquely defined, but if you get any such choice, you call a ring of definition. And uh, these, these ideas are called ideals of definition. Okay. So let's see some examples. Well, first of all, just take any discrete ring, any, dis any ring with a discrete topology, that will do. Um, you can take something which looks like it comes from formal geometry, ZP double bracket C, and maybe with, you have to always specify the topology, yeah? So putting the PT adic topology, you can come in. <laughs> um, and more generally, just take any uh, edit ring with a finitely generated ideal of definition, okay? Yeah, so, but this is a really good example to think about. Then, yeah, I said edit spaces, they should see rigid analytic geometry, so typical rings there. Like the most basic ring, maybe that will oops, we'll carry this around is QP in an angle bracket T. So, this is oh, no, it's maybe too small. Let me move. Ah, and let me continue here and then move over there. Um, right, so. These are the rings, the power series. With um, coefficients in QP that converge to zero. It's kind of plate algebra, it's called. And so this is, yeah, this is a typical example where you take A naught, for example, to be ZP T, and then you put it at the P-adic topology on it. And more generally, you can look at rings from rigid geometry. So. So they typically would look like you have a non Archimedean field. Um, you have a bunch of variables, and maybe a quotient out by some ideal A. You know? So these rings will all be Huber rings. Um, but you can also look at like um, maybe non Noetherian rings, as, as long as you put some topology on them um, that comes from a finitely generated ideal of definitions. For example, you could look at the field CP. You know? In it, you have the ring of integers. In the p-adic topology, and so this would also work. Now, even if this uh, ring of um, definition would not be Noetherian, but as long as the ideal is finally generated, it's okay. All right, so then there are certain rings, certain kinds of Huber rings, which we like more, and those are the so-called Tate rings. So what are these? <clears throat> a Huber ring is called Tate if it contains a topological annealed potent unit. Um, in the theory, the name that's given it to it is mostly wild pi, and uh, we also call it a pseudo-uniformized I can do that, yeah. I didn't know that there was, oh, there's, space. Oh, there's lots of space. Thanks. Right. Okay. 
Um, so, for example, from the things we've seen above, so you can show it. This is a tape ring. No, but this one isn't. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, so they'll come up again and again for reasons that hopefully will become clearer later. Um, and so I have to yeah, tell you two more concepts before I move over to the A plus that is up there. So, um, so let, let's take a Huber ring A. Then uh, a subring which is always important is the subring of so-called power bounded elements. Okay, so this is denoted by A cert and it's a yeah, it's the subring of power bounded elements. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I should maybe say something about what, what, what I mean. So X is power bounded, i.e. So you take an X such that, you know. Um, so if you take all its powers, then this forms a bounded subset of this topological ring. It is bounded. Okay. Right, and then a good quality that a <coughs> Huber ring can have is, is that it can be uniform. So, and it, again, this will come up a lot. So A is uniform if this ring of power bounded elements itself is a bounded subset. And what will then happen is that you can take this A upper cert to be a ring of definition. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's good. Um, did I move this up as well? Okay, so this is a bit like, yeah, very brief introduction of what what the A is in, in such a such an affinoid attic space that we're gonna construct. Um, and so now let me go and tell you very briefly about the data of this pair. So about the A plus that you need. So what is this? So we say that a subring of a Huber ring Is a ring of definition. Uh, so, is a ring of integral elements. If the definition, if it is open and integrally closed. In A. And if moreover it's contained in the power bounded elements. Okay, so that's the datum, the datum of the A plus. Okay, and now you can now this pair this pair of A and A plus. We just give it the name of a Huber pair. We call them Huber pairs. And this is just the, from these affinoid attic spaces are built. To so such a pair, we're gonna in a moment um, attach a topological space and so on and so forth. So this is a starting point. So it's a, yeah, this definition had a part one, so part two. A Huber pair is just a pair A A plus with A Huber ring and uh, A plus a ring of integral elements. But 
And if you're new to the theory and what follows, so I guess as, as long as you, you can possibly do this, just always take A plus to be the, power, the ring of power bounded elements. So this will certainly do. And as a first, yeah, in a first round, you can just do that. I'll indicate why we need the A plus in a bit, but for now, this is the starting datum. And so for example, with our two favorite examples, so let's, if you, if you start with this Tate algebra, then you can just take ZP in the brackets T as a A plus. And in the example of the power series over ZP, you can actually take the same ring to be the A plus. So these two are examples of Huber pairs, okay? All right. So now let me tell you about the spa construction very briefly. So if you want to build an affinoid addict space now to such a Huber pair, you have to attach first of all a topological space, okay? And so Yeah, that will fit here. So this topological space, which will also call spa AA plus, is defined um, as a set of continuous valuations. So actually you take equivalence classes of such things and we write it out and then say something about it. Um, so of continuous Valuations. Um, so these are valuations on the ring A, and they land in some value group, which can be any totally ordered abelian uh, group, union zero. So um, yeah, so this is a totally ordered abelian group. So maybe if you're used to norms, then this would be typically the positive reals, but it can be um, a larger group as well, and it can be yeah, any any such thing as you like. And there's you can put a, a meaning of what it means such a for such a value for a valuation to be continuous. I'm not gonna give you the definition, it would take too long, but um, there's such a notion. And so you take all these together um, and you demand that um, all things in this ring of integral elements, A plus, they'll be valued by something less than or equal to one, one in your group, okay? Yeah, and so it's important that this, this totally ordered building group can be pretty arbitrary. It in particular can have higher rank, so we'll come back to that later. Um, but let me just introduce a piece of notation. So when I carry around these, um, yeah, I'm about to say, if I take an element in here, then, We'll typically denote elements by x, and then we're going to write um, g goes to uh, this expression. So you think of evaluating a function at s and taking its norm, and it's just the notation for this valuation that it corresponds to. So for the choice in this equivalence class uh, of valuation. Okay. So that's the. The, the, well, the set underlying the topological space that we want to build. And so I have to tell you a little bit about how to put a topology on this thing. Do you need me to put it up more? Is it okay? So in this non-Archimedean geometry, in these periodic geometries, the, um, the topologies are defined by inequalities, okay? So in, in algebraic geometry, we typically look at vanishing loci and the complements of those um, that define the topology, but in this non-Archimedean world, we define topologies by inequalities. 
And so a typical open set, in a topology on, um, on this spa A A plus, uh, is defined, is generated by sets of the following form. They're called rational subset, rational, rational subsets. And they look like this. So you take, so the first bit is technical, but I, I'm including it anyway. So you're taking a finite set um, such that if you look at its translate under A, then this is an open subset. And you take another element in A, and then you can look at all um, all elements in spa AA plus such that um, the elements in T are valued less than or equal to the element S, and you demand that this guy is non-zero. So on this space, on this subset, then what will happen, for example, is that S will not attain the zero value and um, it will be invertible. So, And on this subset, yeah, all the elements in T will be bounded by S. So these are the typical opens. And as it turns out, by a process called rational localization, you can find a Huber pair so that this guy identifies with it, identifies with its attached spa, so identity. Um, so the, yeah, the ring that you have to put here, I'm just gonna denote it as it's denoted, but I'm not gonna say much about its construction, but so the, the important thing is that you can find a Huber pair such that this open is realized as a spa of this Huber pair. And in order to do this, so here, when you want to do this, so this is kind of, you need A plus to make this work. Right, okay, so if you take a step back again and just see what, what I've done so far, I've introduced a topological ring and I've uh, kind of then attached to it a, a a topological space, um, and I've defined it in, uh, yeah, using the, the the concept of continuous valuation. So, a first question you could ask is why not study all of them? Why not just attach to A the set of continuous valuations and try to make this work? And and here here is one one um, one place in the theory where this would fail. So, you really want these kind of uh, these kind of sets to to be your open sets, and you really want to have them again as spa of something, and this would not this would not correspond to a continuous to the set of continuous valuations on some ring. So so here is one part in the theory where the A plus really shows up. And I haven't told you anything about this um, this ring here, but as a ring itself, it's maybe not so bad. What you do is you localize first of all um, just your ring by S, and but then you have to put a certain topology on it, which is maybe a bit wordy to define, and you have to complete it by this. So let me not spell it out, but you can look it up. Okay. Uh, it's just, yeah, I'm, I mean, it's just a technical condition that actually makes this work. So it, it rules out um, taking whatever, uh, T to be zero, for example, or to have like weird open sets. Yeah, you shouldn't take it. Um, I mean, So what's this, yeah, so this topological space has um, a few properties. One of them, yeah, the most important one maybe is that it's a spectral space. So abstractly isomorphic to the spectrum of some ring, 
In other words, it's quasi-compact. Uh, it has a basis of quasi-compact ovens that are um, stable and finite intersections. Actually, you can check that this, this is true for these rational subsets. Um, and that you have, a, that every irreducible closed subset has a unique generic point. So this allows you to study these uh, spaces using specializations. Okay? All right. And yeah, let me indicate now how these, so, so I said that this value group, this continuous valuations is um, very yeah, flexible, doesn't have to be the real, can be of higher rank. And let me indicate why these higher rank uh, points are important in the theory or what, what, what they can do for you. So the freedom of choosing um, higher rank valuations, higher rank valuations. So it's important for topological considerations. So it's important. Yeah, for, for the topology of the space. Um, for example, it makes spaces connected. Yeah, so if you classically look at something like the um, closed unit disk, actually that, that is the example I wanna discuss, so let me write it out. So for example, if you look at the attic spectrum, that's associated to this Hooper pair I've introduced before. And this has a reinterpretation. Now, if you know this from rigid geometry, then you think of this as a closed unit disk, and here this is the same. Um, and yeah, the question is that if you build this, um, is this a connected space or not? Because somehow in, if you just look at this as a piadic kind of unit disk, then well, piadics are very disconnected. So, so have you managed to do this uh, in some sense so that this is really a connected space which you would like to have? And, and the answer is, well, let's, let's see. I mean, um, if you look at two um, subsets of this closed unit disk, namely the kind of boundary maybe it's called U, and then you look at increasing unions of smaller disks, but converging to one. It's defined by an inequality like so. Then if you look at the union of these, they will, in, they will converge to the radii, these disks will converge to one. And so this kind of looks like um, it could cover the space, the question is, is D the union of this U and then all the Vs, the Ns, but um, actually no, and you can see this, this higher rank points um, these higher rank points um, prevent this from being true. There'll be as I, I'm going to write down on the other board an example of a, of a point in the attic spectrum which is neither in U nor in any of the Vs. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why these higher rank points are important. Oh, so now, now everyone has seen the Thompson's unit, sorry. Right, so the following, we'll consider the following valuation on UP angle brackets T, it's gonna land in um, a value group of rank two, so it's 
can form the product of the positive uh, reals with a cyclic group. And you demand um, here that this gamma is between all re real numbers that are smaller than one and one. Um, and you put, like on this product, you put the lexicographic order, or the dictionary order. Um, and so then you can define a variation by sending such a power series to the max. And then you take the value of a n gamma to the n. Yeah, we're all coefficients. And it turns out that, well, let's see. I mean, if you take, believe me that this defines you a continuous valuation, um, then let's evaluate what's the valuation of T under this value, uh, valuation X minus. Well, it's going to be gamma, right? Uh, and so, so by, by construction, this gamma is less than one, but greater than any real number. So it'll, by construction, this will, the X minus will not be in U and it will not be in any of the VNs, okay? But it defines the point on your eddic spectrum, so this is not the, yeah. These opens over there, they don't cover the disk. So this, this, well, this is not a disk, this is not a disconnected cover of the disk. And the disk, in fact, turns out to be a connected space. <laughs> All right, so let me move on. So we've, what we've, we've done is we've seen what a Hoover ring is, the ingredient of an attic space. Um, of an alpinoid attic space. We've looked at this pair construction and now I've to kind of indicated what a topological space attached to it is. And so in order to really build an attic space, you need something more, you need to build a structure sheaf. This is the final ingredient. And what you do is, well, you build a pre-sheaf actually. And I'll be very brief here, but um, yeah, what's happening is that if you now take this topological space, then it carries a pre sheaf of topological rings, um, structural pre sheaf, we're going to denote it by OX. Actually, there'll be a second one called OX plus, it'll keep track of the plus rings. And you're doing it by saying, well, the global sections, um, they're supposed to give me my ring back at least if it's completed. And so in general, you have to complete. Um, and on these rational subsets, you wanna get back the Huber ring that gives rise to them, so you want to get back the A, B over S. And this is by design already completed, so I don't have to worry about this. But by the way, it's true that this um, construction of the spa is independent of uh, the completion. So if you complete A, then you're going to get the same topological space. Mm -hmm. And right, so, but you can demand this and you can then check actually, but um, you can, so this is a, this for, these guys form the basis for your topology and you can check that you can beef this up to a, a, a pre-sheaf of topological rings, okay? Um, right, and so that, that now there's a big nuisance in the theory. This can fail to be a sheaf. So that's bad news because it means that we cannot now, we can't just, yeah, we can't just go ahead and glue everything or, and, and be happy with um, what's going on. So I have to, yeah, but the good news is that, well, in many cases, we know it's actually a sheaf. So let me just give you an overview of when this is okay. Yeah, and if OX is a sheaf, then automatically OX plus is a sheaf as well. Okay. 
I should I shouldn't push down so hard in the chalk. <laughs> Right, and the, so the OX plus is going to recover your A pluses. Uh, okay, right. So it's not always a sheaf, but if it's if it is a sheaf, and we call the Huber pair it's sheafy. Okay. And we know that everything's good for the following type of rings, class of rings. So if you start with a discrete ring, everything's fine. You're going to get automatically a sheaf. If you have started with a ring, which is finitely generated over an Ethereum ring of definition, you're also okay. So this is from the, you come from the category of like admissible formal schemes. Will be, you'll be in phase two. If you're in rigid geometry, then you typically have a Tate ring, and it'll be what's called strongly Noetherian. So strongly Noetherian means that if you take the Tate algebra, these angle brackets and a bunch of variables, then you're still um, Noetherian. Then in this case, also we know it's a sheaf. Um, Fourth case, I want to mention if this uh, Hubert pair is what's called stably uniform. Uh, and A, uh, A is Tate. Um, so, yeah, whenever I have a Hubert pair where A is Tate, I'm going to, uh, these are called Tate Hubert pairs, I guess. I haven't said that. So, what stably uniform means? Uh, here's the stably uniform means the following. So recall that I uh, I defined a uniform earlier by saying that the subring of power bounded elements should be a bounded subring, right? And stable uniform is that this is inherited for any rational subset. So this is uniform um, for all u in x rational. Right. So in this case, this is the result due to positive for backness. Uh, in this case, this is also going to be sheafy. And nowadays we have further results in um, different directions. So let me just mention a few names. So Hitlaya and Hansen have um, some, yeah, some results and I guess there's a recent result also by Sadgialov um, about where you could even, yeah, take care of sort of formal schemes over OC or something. Okay, so there are, this is an active area of research. There's certainly open questions. Um, you can co cook up all kinds of Huber rings, but maybe we don't know a priori uh, that they're sheafy, but we have also a good control actually under the standard examples. All right. Okay, should speed up. Right, so now we can at least say what an attic space is now. So we find as follows. There is a triple. Consisting of a topological space, a sheaf of topological, uh, complete topological rings. And there's a third ingredient, which, uh, is the following that you want to have, in fact, you want to have valuations on the stalks. So this is how Huber defines this ambient category. Um, so you take a triple like that. So these are valuations, it's equivalence classes of valuations on the stalks, actually that have support, the maximal idea. Um, and so you want this triple to locally look like an affinoid attic space, like a spa AX. 
Okay. And yeah, the fact that you're doing it this way is like, because you don't a priori know that this is sheafy, so you can't really just glue these guys somehow. So, but you have to, you have to start up with this, the datum that you already have a sheaf. And then you can say, and look, locally, it looks like a, a sheafy, like the addict spectrum attached to a sheafy Huber pair. All right. And so let me discuss some examples. So, um, right, so we've already seen kind of the, Q, the closed unit disk. Let me just mention it again. I have it in my list here. Um, and then, well, yeah, then you can glue things. I mean, sometimes it works, and it works especially w well if they're just these, these phases are just included one, one in another. So, for example, you can now look at. Um, well, closed unit disks, but with varying radi radii. And what you end up constructing is the affine line. So this is not going to be an affinoid space. This is going to be something non quasi compact. And uh, yeah, this is going to be called the affine line in this business. And uh, yeah, let me write down one more. Um, let me write it down first and then say something about it. The ends? The free end of the Ah, uh, well, these guys, the, the radius was slightly, um, what was going to converting to one. So this one here, unless I messed it up, is supposed to give you disks of radius like P to the N and so on. So going to infinity, so, so it's more. Mm -hmm. right. Right, so remember this Huber pair from before. What I can do is I can look, so this is a pair, this is a space that is defined over ZP, and I can look at its so-called generic fiber. I can look at the spaces at the, the points where he does not vanish. So I can form this sort of fiber product. You have to be a bit careful in this business of adic spaces. Fiber products don't always exist, but you can do this. Um, in this example, you can build this fiber product, but word of caution, this is actually going to turn out to be something which is not quasi compact. Yeah? So this is also not going to be an affinoid adic space, it's rather going to give you the open unit disk. So this is all not, uh, you've not seen this before, this is not obvious at all, it's just, yeah, I'm just trying to give you. Sorry? What did I do? Oh, sorry. No, no. I said it, but yeah. Okay, and so, right. In these lectures, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on a class of, um, of adic spaces that are um, be better behaved in many aspects, and they're called analytic adic spaces. And these, these are spaces that, so remember at the very beginning, I told you we like some sort of rings more than others. Um, and here, we're going to come up again. So these are adic spaces that are locally of the form um, spa AA plus with A a tate ring. Okay, and um, you can characterize its points as well. So the, these points are then called also an analytic adic space will only have analytic points and they are defined, you can define a, um, an analytic point as being one um, such that 
if a point will define you a valuation, um, yeah, and then ideally on a tate ring. And so, but these are all, always going to have um, the property that their support, so these are all the points where this valuation vanishes, um, is not open. Right. So there are classes of addict spaces that come from these Tate rings, which are better behaved, and um, we're going to just focus on them. I lost the sponsorship. All right. So this was a very brief uh, overview of the theory of addict spaces or the definition. Um, oh no, it's actually okay. And I would now move on to perfected spaces mm -hmm. and just tell you a bit about those. Uh, yes, you can recover them as so you're kind of looking at uh, low side where the like elements in the um, uh, elements that are that <laughs> whose valuation is less than or equal to one. Sorry, so yeah, sorry. <laughs> right, you can recover this. Yes. Okay. So what's a perfected space? So I'll tell you the definition um, first, and then I'll tell you later uh, what they can do and why they're so um, successful and important. Okay, so an attic space, uh, sorry, a perfected space will be an attic space whose underlying rings are perfectoid, and those is defined as follows. So we say a complete height ring R is perfectoid. If first of all, R is uniform, and there is a pseudo uniformizer, var pi, such that var pi to the p divides p in R circ, okay, and such that Frobenius um, on if you look at Frobenius on R naught mod var pi to R naught mod pi, var pi to the p, then this is so the map is x goes to x to the p. Yeah. So this is an isomorphism. Okay. Yeah. This is a definition of a perfect Tate ring. I should first of all say that there exist more general definitions. There's, a, for example, a notion of integral perfect ring, but I'm not going to discuss them here. Um, and originally, maybe the first definition you'd want to give or that was around is that of a perfectoid field. And let me also give this. So this is a non-Archimedean field. So meaning a field that's um, complete with respect to rank one valuation. Um, and it has residue characteristic P um, with non discrete value group and you want again you want the Frobenius um, to be an isomorphism or the way I'm putting it here this is sometimes phrased uh, slightly differently so here this Frobenius condition is really a surjectivity condition. And so, yeah. Okay. So this is the definition of a perfect good field. Um, and maybe this was, by, yeah, this was introduced um, maybe as a first definition by Schultz and then um, one would look at perfectoid algebras that are defined over a perfectoid field, but then later one, one generalized this definition to just work with Tate rings. So these Tate rings, they're not necessarily defined over a field, but anyways. 
both these notions are important. And it's actually true that if you give yourself a perfect good um, ring, which happens to be a field, then it is automatically a perfected field. So this is a result theorem of Kedler. Yeah, let me just mention this in passing. So if you have a perfected um, hate ring, which is a field, then you get that R is a perfected field. Okay, so let me give you some examples. So first example is you take the cyclotomic uh, extension of QP. So this is, you attach all P to the N roots of unity and then you complete this. Um, another example of a perfect good field is by attaching to P all roots, P power roots of P. Um, uh, example in characteristic P for, is by taking the Laurent series and then um, attaching all P power roots of the variable and then completing again. So this is what I mean by this. Um, and let me also mention CP. So these are all fields, all perfect fields. Um, and maybe something that yeah, is not of this form. So if you have a perfect field, then um, you can form the, this is called the perfected unit disk. And look at this algebra. Um, this is gonna give rise to the perfected unit disk. And you have to say maybe what this is. So you take the ring of integers and then you attach to it all the P power roots of the variable. And then you complete this with respect to the uh, correct topology and then you invert P. Okay, so this is the definition here. This is gonna give rise to what people call the perfected unit disk. All right. And then I say I should say one more thing about these rings. Um, at this point, so maybe this explains the name. So if you take a complete Tate ring in characteristic P, then um, perfect, being perfected is actually the same as demanding it's perfect. Okay, right. So now um, these are the Huber rings that go into a perfected space. And so next thing I want to say that we take the spa of this and then get a perfected space. But I told you that chiefiness is an issue. So I have to at least argue briefly why why we can do this. Oh, perfect just means that uh, the map x goes to x to the p is an isomorphism. Okay. Right. So now the theorem due to Scholze that if you take a Huber pair, where R is perfected, then this is gonna define you an attic space. So um, in other words, well, how, how does it work? It's, it, it's true that if you take a rational subset, and you look at its um, sections of the pre-structure sheaf at this point, then O x of u, this is the content of this theorem, then O x of u is again perfected. Okay. But now, um, well, 
being perfected by definition included being uniform. So this gives you that, in fact, this is a stably uniform guy. So hence, it's bar R, R plus is an attic space. So R, R plus is a uh, sheafy here. Yeah. So is, is a, an attic space as R, R plus is stably uniform. Which is great news because we don't have to worry about this business then. Okay, so this is an affinoid, uh, this is an attic space, and these guys are going to be called affinoid perfectoids. Okay, and so we can now define a perfected, the notion of a perfected space, and it's just, um, this is indeed what you hopefully think it is. So a perfected space is what an attic space. which locally looks like like an affinoid attic space. Okay, so now that I've told you roughly their definition or what they are, sorry? What did I say? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Right, so why are they so uh, successful? Why can we, uh, yeah, why are they so powerful? The reasons why perfected spaces are a very powerful tool in the adding geometry. So I want to give three. So one is that the they form, yeah, you can go to characteristic P. This is what is called the tilting equivalence. That's a bridge to characteristic P. Um, secondly, this is something which is called almost purity. <clears throat> um, it contains the etile size of these perfected spaces. And then three, um, is the relation to arbitrary analytic spaces. So any analytic analytic space can be related in a specific way uh, to a perfected space. I'll make this precise later, yeah? But this is not, it's not the case that they form kind of separate colors of attic rings, but really, if you're interested in an arbitrary analytic attic ring, perfected spaces will help you understand it. All right. Uh, so let me see how I'm doing on time. <laughs> not good. Okay. All right. So let me tell you a bit about tilting. So tilting is the bridge to characteristic P. Yes. And um, what what I want to say here is that, well, first of all, to any perfected ring, you can um, associate a ring in characteristic P in a natural way. So let me just define this. If you have a perfected ring and it's tilt, it's defined as follows. So it's a ring which you call R flat, and it's defined as the inverse limit over copies of R, where the transition maps are raising x to the pth power. And it has a slightly funny addition. You have to be careful how to define the addition here. 
but multiplication is component wise. Um, and it's, you, you put on it the inverse limit topology, and then you're going to get a topological SP algebra is the outcome. Okay? And this is going to give you a perfect ring. So this is a perfect uh, Tate ring. And um, well, yeah, and it has a pseudo uniformizer. And if you, if you um, select the pseudo uniformizer in your ring R, in your perfected ring R in a good way, and that it has all kinds of Keith, Keith roots, you can do that. Then there's a corresponding pseudo uniformizer, which is the topology on, on here by just looking at uh, yeah, successive Keith roots. Okay? Right. <laughs> and so, for example, when you tilt, where's the field here? When you tilt the QP cyclotomic, and uh, actually you're going to get the field that I also wrote down. So let me give you one example. So for example, turns out QP cyclotomic, if you tilt that, then you're gonna get this perfected field that I wrote down in characteristic P. Okay, and this is a re like this is the result that actually was known before. This is due to Fontaine, I think. Right, you have a multiplicative map back to um, multiplicative map back from the tilt to R, which is important. Um, namely, what you can do is you just you can take such a sequence in your tilt and you just project it down to the first entry. So this map is the sharp map and it kind of features in all sorts of constructions. And um, yeah, and then you actually what you get is that if you mod out now our uh, flat circ by the pseudo uniformizer, then it's isomorphic as a ring to the corresponding quotient of R. Okay. Do not write that down. And let me just say in words also to save a bit of time that there's a course, we can do the corresponding thing for the ring of integral elements and you also get a tilt there. So this behaves nicely. And so then let me summarize things in the following theorem due to Scholze and also Kedlaya. So this is what we call the tilting equivalence. And so, yeah, what this, this now explains you what this characteristic, what this bridge to characteristic P is. Sort of. So, if you take a Huber ring, a Huber pair, which is perfect to it, meaning the R is perfect to it, um, and you look at its tilt, and as I said, at least orally, that uh, you can do, you can also tilt the plus rings, so you get a corresponding ring there. Um, then, then you can build a morphism between the corresponding attic spaces, which turns out to be a homeomorphism from the spy of RR plus to the tilt, which is just defined as the attic spectrum of R flat, R flat plus. Uh, and actually, you can write this down because it's yeah, it's a thing that you that you can write down. And you take a valuation and you form the corresponding valuation on the characteristic P ring by saying F should be valued as you take the F sharp, which brings you back to your original ring R, and then you take the valuation there. So this is a homeomorphism and it preserves a rational subset. And 
moreover, this globalizes, so this construction glues. So you can tilt an arbitrary perfect grid space. And the important thing here is that, that all topological information can be recovered from the tilt, can be recovered from characteristic P, but there's a, like something is lost. So if you, if you think of X being maybe a characteristic zero at X space, and you have a structure map, maybe say to spa QP or spa ZP, and this information will be lost under tilt. Okay, but all the topological information otherwise is, is, is still there, but then you can, with your tilt, you're in characteristic P. Okay, and uh, yeah, it has a, this tilting um, equivalence has, has a second part, which I'm also going to write down. So there's another theorem that I want to mention. Namely, if you fix a perfecter factoid ring um, with tilt R flat, then this tilting gives you an equivalence of categories between perfected algebras over your starting um, perfected algebra and the tilt. So there exists an equivalent of categories from perfected R algebras to perfect it um, R flat algebras, which is given by tilting, which sends S to its tilt. Yeah? So as long as you fix the base, there's really, you can go back this kind of the, the content, okay? okay? Right, so this was, yeah, this was what I wanted to say for the first part. And the second thing, should I, called almost purity, well, it tells you that this tilting works in an even better way, namely um, when you're talking about etal, uh, when you're thinking about etal sites. So um, the theorem that I want to write down goes back to, well, it has inputs from faultings and then again, Kedlaya, Liu, and Schultze. And it says the following. So again, if you take a perfected algebra with tilt R flat, then as, as I just explained that, it, yeah, you can go back on the level of topological spaces, but now this is, yeah, this, this theorem tells you something even better. It tells you that any finite at all R algebra S is first of all perfected. So you can look at finite etal extensions of perfected algebra and be in the same category. And you can tilt those, and there's going to be an equivalence again. So tilting um, induces an equivalence between finite etal algebras, uh, etal R algebras, and finite etal are flat algebras. <coughs> so again, S goes to S flat. And even better, you can beef this up to an honest etal site um, that is identified under tilt. So this is the third part, sort of. So let X give F any perfected space. Now this also globalizes. So then this can really be arbitrary. Then tilting induces an isomorphism of eta sites. Um, 
um, where I haven't told you what an etal morphism is, so let me just briefly explain. So here etal, how do you, how do you, do you define etal morphisms between perfected spaces? You define them as being locally on the source, um, a composition of open immersions and finite etal entire maps. And it, this turns out to be a good workable notion. Um, if you're familiar with etal morphisms like from algebraic geometry, then you can define them in very different ways. But they're useless here, these different ways, because uh, it turns out perfected algebras uh, are always going to be reduced. Okay, So infinitesimal thickenings and so on, this is not going to give you any reasonable um, definition. But you can then define them this way, and then you can say, well, you can also say what a cover is, just saying, I say this orally. You want to have a jointly surjective maps of etal, uh, yeah, jointly surjective etal maps is going to form a cover. So there's a definition of a site, and this is going to be identified under tilting. Right. So now, why is this called almost purity? Well, yeah. So let me just make one remark, and due to time, this is all I, I can do. The probe here uses deep mathematics. Um, due to faulting, so uses almost mathematics, it's called. Um, and that at least, well, this at least indicates why, why the, the almost is in the title. But anyways, I'll leave it at that. Um, and let me also just tell you that for fields, you recover nice theorems that maybe also were known before. So this, yeah, for fields, finite et al. thing takes, tells you something about the Galois groups and Galois extensions, right? And so if you think then what this means, um, then you're going to recover a, compos yeah, a comparison of Galois groups of these perfected fields. And in the special cases, um, especially, yeah, the, the one that was on the board before, this was known before, so this is a theorem due to Fontaine and Vantan Berger. So, but it is now true, yeah, as a, you can get it as a corollary of this um, theory, sort of that the Galois group of the um, absolute um, closure of QP cyclic comics, sorry, is going to be isomorphic now to the Galois group of this characteristic P perfected field. Okay. So this is remarkable on its own. And yeah. Let me just mention it briefly. Okay. Yeah, I think due to time reasons, uh, this is all I want to say for the regarding this almost purity part. And let me just indicate now in the third bit what perfected space is, how you can relate uh, arbitrary analytic adic spaces to perfected spaces. And we're going to see more of this tomorrow. Yeah. So, But let me mention at least one, one result that gives you an indication. Um, so three. So the yeah, the slogan or what you should remember is that analytic adic spaces they look like uh, perfected spaces if you look um, well etal locally very deep or in other words pro etal locally. So I haven't defined what that is, but. We're going to learn about the proetal topology tomorrow. And let me just say now that analytic attic spaces, proetal locally, look like perfected spaces. And if you like, if you like concrete results, let me just give you the following proposition, which tells you why this is sort of true. So this is due to Faltings, Palmez. So, if you take um, a Tate ZP algebra, then what you can show is that there exists 
a filtered direct system of finite tile maps A for AI such that if you look at all of them together, so if you form the limit such that the limit, well, uh, so sorry, yeah, you can you can find the um, exercetic sequence of maps such that the limit has the additional property that it has no non-split finite it all covers. And so then what this is going to mean is that this is going to give you then that if you complete, then this is a perfect grid algebra. Look at its uh, so-called uniform completion, and this is perfect grid. So meaning you always find a pro etal kind of, yeah, <clears throat> a map from A to A infinity, which will be pro etal with the correct definition, such that this is a perfectoid algebra. And so this gives you a relation, yeah, back to the perfectoid world from any K to ZP algebra, and this is gonna be important in what's coming. Okay, so let me see. Am I done almost? I wanted to say a little bit about applications. If I can have, can I have two more minutes? Yeah. I'm gonna round this up in a non-technical way. So we've glanced at various parts of the theory, but they, yeah, maybe now let me just give you a tiny overview of what they have been used for, these perfected spaces. Uh, let me stress that the following is only a selection, okay? But initially, this is in uh, Peter's thesis, yeah, they were used uh, to prove cases of the weight monogramy conjecture. They were then used, again by Peter, for, um, for showing results in PID Koch theory for rigid analytic spaces. So this uses three uh, and more and cohomological things that I haven't been able to talk about because it would take way too long. Um, this almost purity, so two, has been very, has a successful application in commutative algebra that was used to show the so-called direct summon conjecture. It's maybe a bit unexpected application, but uh, yeah, again, very powerful one. And then, because this is a summer school on Langland, so let me also mention some related things to the, maybe more to the Langlands program. So among other things, they were used to study the cohomology and get results in the cohomology of um, Shimura varieties and locally symmetric spaces with torsion coefficients. And then eventually to attach also Galois representations to automorphic forms. Uh, attach Galois reps to automorphic forms, which really is a very language application, right? Um, they were used to establish a candidate for the mod key and the date for a mod key language correspondence. Mod P Jacke Langlands and Lang uh, local Langlands correspondence. I'm going to just abbreviate. And um, also, which we're going to see, I think, this week, there are applications to the theory of periodic forms. Yeah, and so all of these here, they use that, that towers, they use that um, 
perfected spaces really occur in nature, so to speak. They use the towers of um, Shimura varieties, maybe local ones. They are becoming perfected at infinite level. Um, and in this business, one discovered also the existence of new period maps, and these new period maps, they also are crucial, okay? So this gives you these kind of, uh, yeah, type of applications maybe. And then one final one that I want to mention, and it's obviously, um, yeah, incredible one. So it's the, to the geometrization. of the local Langlands correspondence, so due to the demand of work of Farg and Schultze. But in order to understand this, you need much more, so this needs more. This needs the theory of diamonds, um, which we're gonna yeah, see tomorrow, okay. All right, so sorry for running over time, and thanks for your attention.